Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I will tell you some new, amazing stories. But before you begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, new boss demands I go to work during vacation. Okay, but I have the passwords to my files and I quit. This incident was the final straw for me to change jobs. I used to design shoes. This was at a higher quality brand and it was in New York City. Envision the Devil Wears Prada style variant. I followed an old boss to this position and even before starting, he and HR approved of a planned vacation. After a trying three months, I finally take a break. I receive an email on the last day of my vacation informing me that my boss has been fired and that a new director has been appointed to lead the team. The next Monday, I arrive at work, exhausted after a lengthy flight that was delayed. The new season's collection had just begun to be designed, so I assumed this person was phoning to talk about it. He immediately starts opening this conversation with screaming at me, telling me not to take a vacation during drawing week, and that if the sneakers didn't work out, it was going to be all my fault, and requested that I immediately return. First of all, since it was before I started, there was literally no way I could have realized that this week would be sketching week. Throughout it all, I just managed to get out that it was a sanctioned vacation and my previous boss was fired on that day, that guy officially became my boss. Furthermore, I wasn't a senior level designer, therefore those tasks never should have been mine to begin with. I was so astonished and ashamed afterward that I immediately left his office. I went to HR and started crying in front of the HR woman after trying to gather myself. I had never cried before while working or over a job, so I realized that something needed to change. Once I cried, I made a decision to stop, so I spent the entire week compiling my documents. By the way, these files were password protected to me only. Moreover, I wrote a resignation email. Friday morning, I came in, hit submit, and departed before noon. One of the nicest things I've ever done for my mental and emotional well-being. It was a wonderful sensation. I have no regrets. I'd never felt appreciated or respected in that building outside of the boss I followed to get in there. And now, I work with much friendlier people in a new career. Did this new boss just want to assert himself or what? If the previous boss allowed your colleague to take a vacation, I think you should let them do so. And after it's over, then you can set new rules and regulations if you want to. The employee did the right thing, I think, by quitting. The good thing is that he did not lose anything from this, but the boss lost a lot. In the fashion world, that delay is very bad because of advertising, PR events, and all those other things could have already been ordered for the old date. I think it worked out well that the OP put a password on some of his own files. What do you think? The second story is, Karen ruined my life at several jobs, but I found out one thing, and now she is fired. A little background. I used to work for a CD store in the early 2000s, and I loved my job, with the exception of Karen, one of my coworkers. We were just not friends. She was on the verge of bullying me, but I managed to get by. She is inevitably given the position of key holder, and then develops into a full-fledged bully on a power trip. She made my life absolutely miserable, and I was no longer able to bear my previous favorite job. I filed a formal complaint with HR, but by the time she had realized her mistake, I had already left the company. So when HR looked into my complaints, they discovered that she and the assistant manager were in a relationship. Oops. And she was transferred to another store because fraternizing was against the rules. Evidently, she left that store because she didn't like it. Who obtains a job at the bookstore in another mall? A few months later, I was contently employed at a bookstore. And guess who's there? You guessed it, Karen. And then she starts doing minor things that just irritate me throughout the next six months, like hanging up when I call their business for a customer, or leaving me on hold for an eternity, or not efficiently dealing with the consumer with their wants. I would undoubtedly face consequences. The retaliation? About six months into my career, I learned through store rumors that Karen had been hurt in an accident. She apparently damaged her back and took a leave of absence. She was in pain and couldn't stand for more than 10 minutes at a time. This is important. Her store was shorthanded as a result of her indefinite leave because it was impossible to find someone to take her position while she was on medical leave. 
After a few months, I knew her manager was really irritated. Two months later, I made the decision to go play pool with a handful of my buddies. Rick, a former colleague from the CD store, was also present. Wow, I wish you had been here last night. A reunion would have taken place. The assistant manager and Karen were playing pool here. I asked, was Karen playing pool? Yeah, every Wednesday night they visit. Seriously? That's interesting. Well, every Wednesday? Since when has this been happening? A couple months now, said Rick. Yeah, Karen was out playing pool once a week during her whole medical leave, not at home in incapacitating pain, as she had claimed. I went to her bookstore the following day and requested to speak with the manager. I informed him of her regular pool games and urged him to visit the pool hall next Wednesday night to see her in action. On Thursday, she was fired. She and her friend were attempting to follow me from work when I last saw them. She was warned to leave me alone or face arrest by the police after I called them and brought them inside the police station. After that, she didn't approach me anymore. Why lie about your health like that? It's wild to me. After such people, bosses are not willing to give medical leave to people who actually need it. I've heard many stories about how bosses get frustrated because of employees' deception and other employees suffer because of it. By the way, I don't understand why this Karen is so fascinated with the OP. I think she's literally just insane. But it's good that she at least got her lesson in the end. I hope she learned it well and that she won't go out of her way to mess up anybody else's lives in the future. The next story is HOA against my motorhome. But I'm not a member of the HOA. I have recently moved to a new place. It's a very cozy area with a majestic view of the mountains that is simply breathtaking. Listening to the birds singing, I didn't want to move a foot away from this place. It sounded like nature itself decided to sing me its best lullaby. The location was also very beautiful. It was a whole transportation hub from which it was convenient to go in almost any direction. I must say right away that I had no house on this land. I bought this land specifically to build a small shed for my motorhome. I had long ago sold my house where I had lived since my youth, purely because I wanted my life to be a journey. This is my conscious choice, and all my family supported me in it. I am very lucky to work as a code architect in an IT company, so I work from home. My RV is fully furnished by me and has everything more than my old house did. This motorhome means a lot to me because I put in so much of my work and resources into it that I get scared sometimes. As I remember now, it was a time when you didn't want to do much. It was snowy and wet. In short, the weather was bad, so I decided to stay on my land plot for about a week. Literally, I was about to move on. I came home from the store, and there was a bright letter on my car with a mega bright red stamp that said, Urgent. It was a letter from the local homeowners association. In the letter, they stated that I was violating their rules and bylaws. And if I don't leave here within 70 hours, they will find me $1,700 every day until they tow my RV themselves. As usual, I am out of luck. I specifically bought this land so I wouldn't have any problems with anyone. This land is not part of an HOA. Can't they just think about the meaning of their acronym? Homeowners Association. I don't have a house here. It's just the most empty plot of land in a good location. Like almost all people in this situation, I thought the HOA had made a mistake. I went to the HOA website, found their phone number, and called their office. I was expecting some adequate behavior, maybe even understanding. But I got arrogance. They insisted that my land was under their jurisdiction and threatened that the fines would continue even after they towed my motor home. I realized that I was not going to let this go. So I postponed my trip. For a long time, I didn't even have a mailbox on the site. So these a-holes just threw their letters on my land like garbage. There were a lot of fines, warnings, anything and everything. If I had done what they wanted, I would have paid more in fines than my motorhome is worth. 
some of the members of the HOA were constantly driving by my land, taking pictures, and yelling at me from their cars that I was an a-hole. My friend, who works for the company I work for, and I filed a lawsuit against the HOA. My friend used to be a real estate lawyer. Now he works more with intellectual property, but he is still very competent in his old field. He's constantly in touch with his lawyer friends and knows all the trends in this area, so I was not afraid of anything. The truth is on our side, and I knew it. We filed a lawsuit against the HOA. The lawyer of the HOA was clearly not prepared for the barrage of evidence and several witnesses who testified against them and who were tired of this HOA being run by a-holes who don't respect anyone. By the way, at first, these geniuses from the HOA did not even want to go to court. They had already been written to, or, will we see you in court? And only then did they come. The judge was impressed by this behavior. The HOA lost more than $100,000 in compensation to me and other neighbors who opposed them. All the people who ran this HOA are no longer running it. Instead, new people are now running the HOA. They even invited me to become part of their HOA. But I kindly declined. The last story is how I made a strange boss thousands of dollars poorer and saved my friend. I worked for my university as a resident advisor in a dorm when I was a college student, which was about more than 10 years ago. I managed a floor in one of the campus's student housing complexes as part of a student employment that provided me with accommodation. The work itself was quite straightforward and consisted of enforcing university rules, aiding students with housing concerns, and keeping office hours Monday through Friday. Although I first accepted the job for the housing, I really found the dorm community component to be rather delightful. The majority of the rules governing university living were basic, such as no jogging in the building or no loud music after 9pm. In the event that someone was found to be breaching the regulations, you would advise them to cease and record it in case the problem persisted. Certain regulations, such as smoking indoors or causing bodily harm to someone, also carried penalties. Being locked out of your dorm was one of the rules that came with a fee. The university would charge you $25 if you needed to be let back into your dorm, and $500 to recore the door lock if you had lost your key. I didn't charge a student to enter their dorm the first year that I served as an RA. As a poor student myself, I realized what $25 could mean to someone. Thus, I believed it was a pretty horrible idea. Everything was okay, since my boss, the resident manager of the building, was ready to graduate and really didn't care whether we paid them to enter their room. But my meeting with the other RAs and our new RM, Doug, will take place in year two. Doug was one of those people who was too cordial right away and felt like he could invade your personal space because he was a friend. Things like chatting to you while stroking your arms or shoulders. He distributed all of the building's master keys during the initial meeting. He kept two keys one for each floor, inside a zipper binder along with a key log listing the serial number of each key and the RA that each one belonged to. Later on, that's going to be significant. He distributed keys to each of us individually before adding the second to a duty set of keys that were checked out during the weekend by the two RAs on duty. The procedures for the RA losing a master key are worse than the policies for a student losing a key, which was already terrible as we said before. You would be fired and lose your housing as a result and find the cost of recoring every door on your floor if you lost a master key. That's $12,000. Even though we were all aware of that, I can still clearly remember Doug spending a lot of time in this first meeting reminding us of it and explaining that since we now had the keys, he was no longer in charge of them. A few weeks into the semester, another RA and I, who are buddies, are making duty rounds in the building. We'll refer to her as Brittany. Brittany is incredibly intelligent, confident, and always up for a joke, so I enjoyed serving on duty alongside her. Brittany, meanwhile, seems a little down today. She eventually tells me that Doug has been making her feel really uncomfortable and that he's been touching her, because I too found that to be really weird and would detest how nearly he would go to me when we chatted. I thought I knew what she meant. She didn't intend to say that. She refused to report him when I asked her to, likely because Doug was one of the department's golden boys. 
and Brittany had repeatedly told him off since she had enough and didn't think it would happen again, but she also requested me to be by her side while he was around. I inquired about Doug's reputation with another female RA I was friendly with after learning what Brittany had told me. She didn't say that he had hurt her, but she did say that she didn't enjoy being alone with him herself. He seemed creepy to me, so whenever I had to speak with him, I cut my sentences short. I made sure to stay until everyone had departed after staff meetings and to hang around the office doorway in case Doug summoned one of the girls back. I continue to perform my duties like I did the year before as the year goes on. I record significant and insignificant events, but I never record letting students back into their dorms. One weekend, while on duty, I receive a page from a student on the duty pager. Yeah, a pager. I phone the student and discover that they've been locked out on a different level. I go to allow them back into their dorm after grabbing the duty set of keys. Doug approaches me in the corridor and inquires about my activities. After a brief interaction in which I inform him that I'm allowing a student into their room, I go on my way without thinking twice about it. I then get a call to come into the office the following Monday. About the student I allow into his room and how frequently I have to let people in, I get questioned. I tell them the truth. I don't charge the students, and I do it frequently throughout the month. He seemed to believe that my failure to charge them is theft from the institution because the students are told of the rules and their obligations when they receive the keys. He informed me that he was reporting me for disciplinary action after allegedly reviewing every report made under my user ID and discovering that I had never had anyone pay for being let back into their room. The disciplinary action was ineffective, or at least no one in authority ever talked to me about it. Yet, for me, this marked a boundary that only helped to confirm how I felt about him. School remains largely the same. A few months before the year comes to an end, Brittany, who is obviously sad, and I are performing duty rounds once again. She reportedly had a late night and a few drinks with pals a few nights earlier. She was roused from her inebriated slumber the next morning by a student after they locked themselves out of their room. She seized her master key while still partially sleeping and allowed the pupil inside. However, instead of hanging the key up when she got back into her room, she had placed it on the counter, where it eventually dropped into the garbage. The following morning when she awoke, she brought her garbage to the dumpster without realizing what had happened, and before she realized what had happened, it had already been taken to the landfill. For Brittany, losing her job, her home, and paying $12,000 as a fine were completely unaffordable. She had no idea what to do at this point. We debate back and forth and determine that we need to find a means to create a new key without anyone knowing after weighing the pros and cons of telling anyone what had transpired. We didn't have much time to move either because Doug was randomly checking keys every day. The university keys are created using a key blank that is apparently unavailable from the neighborhood shops for the same reason. As a result, we searched the internet for a duplicate and eventually discovered one that appeared to be a match. We weren't really certain because the internet image was only a shadow of what the key's shape appeared to be. We decided to get it anyway though because it was the finest option we had. All right. A strategy developed. We made the decision to create a copy of the second master key on the duty set during the middle of the week, when it's not in use, after our key blank arrived. The second issue was that even when we had a functioning duplicate of the key, we would still need to figure out how to restore the serial number to the copy. Fortunately, Brittany knew someone who had hammer stamps that we could use to imprint the numbers on the key, and I managed to recall Doug's binder with the serial numbers. He could always hear if someone entered Doug's office because it was across the hall from his room. That fell to me since Doug and Brittany had a horrible relationship and we didn't want him to discover her there by herself. During one of my weekend shifts, I entered the workplace after sunset. I crept inside after opening the door as softly as I could, keeping it slightly ajar so that no one in the hallway could see me right away. As I heard his door open, I had barely begun to search for the binder. Doug appears as expected and inquires as to what I am doing. While my pulse is beating against my skull, I had concocted what I believed to be a plausible falsehood. I informed him that because my laptop wasn't working, I would have to use the university computer in his office to report the incident. He believed the lie because it seemed plausible. So, after he left me alone to go on another hunt, it didn't take long for me to locate the binder and assign Brittany the key number. In case Doug checked and was already out of the building, I went ahead and submitted a false report on the minor offense. 
We kept checking to see whether the key blank would show up each day. It was thrilling to sense the strategy coming together since it was dependent on this key. And when it did, it was an exact match. Apart from the big key brand imprinted all over it, there was no way to conceal it, and it was too obvious to pass for a genuine key. The entire scheme appeared to fail. In order for Brittany to utilize the key without being identified as not having her master key, we chose to still make a duplicate on this branded blank. Brittany used the second master key from the duty set after waiting until the middle of the week to create a replica. As soon as she received it, we discussed the strategy and made jokes about how convenient it would be if we could simply alter the digits on the second key to match the serial number of the first. We looked at how many numbers we would need to modify because it appeared likely it wouldn't work. And in the end, it was zero. During our initial meeting, when Doug gave us our keys and emphasized that we would lose our jobs if we misplaced them, he unintentionally gave Brittany his copy. As we came to the conclusion that we were done, Brittany placed her master key in her lockbox. Nobody had discovered that the duty set was missing a key after two weeks. We had a student pretend to be locked out when Brittany was in town since we were sick of waiting. The answering RA was baffled as to why none of the keys were functional and didn't know what to do, so they contacted Doug. Doug summoned Brittany back to the dorm so he could use her master key because he couldn't get any of the other keys to work either. Of course, she was pleased to help him out with that. The major bosses got involved when everyone noticed a master key was missing. There was a thorough building search, a check of the dorm rooms, and several RA interviews. Only Brittany and I among the RAs were knowledgeable, so we pretended ignorance with everyone else. I think they had first suspicions about Brittany, but when she was able to present the right master key, their attitude towards her completely changed. As you would expect, the floor now had to be record. They were never able to locate the key. Thus, they were unable to hold anyone accountable for the occurrence. They basically beat us all up in a meeting on keys and the significance of their security. Even though the gathering was for all of us, Doug was given a lot of special attention. It appears that keeping track of the keys on the duty set required him to fill out a key log each day as a part of his job, and there was no way to determine how long the key had been missing because he had not been doing it. This was significant since those keys were given to him and he hadn't been made aware of the rules and his obligations when he received them, as he had explained to me when he wrote me up. He was the boss's favorite though, therefore they didn't terminate him as we had all been advised. Although I'm not sure of the precise amount, Doug did wind up receiving a sizable fine, and I do know that he was quite angry about it. I didn't interact with Doug much more because the year was almost over and he would be moving to another building the following year. I was made aware though that he ultimately lost his job as the result of an incident with a female RA. $12,000 for a fine for a lost key? For a student? Are they crazy? That's such a huge burden. In other jobs, a person would probably be fired for losing this key, but here a young student loses his or her housing and has to pay such a huge amount it's already so expensive to study and universities have such an aggressive policy i understand that it's obviously terrible when a master key is lost and security is compromised but that's really not that fair like who takes responsibility in that regard what are they trying to achieve with this policy on one hand it's understandable but still it's also worth noting that your friend consciously agreed to all this and knew the consequences of his actions. Therefore, if we think about the law and compliance with contracts, your friend should have received the fine, even if it is such a stupid one. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.